Chapter Three, Section Three, Part A of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Capital, a critical analysis of capitalist production, Volume One, by Karl Marx, translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Abeling, and edited by Friedrich Engels. Part One. Commodities and Money, Chapter Three, Money or the Circulation of Commodities, Section Three, Money, Introduction and Hoarding. The commodity that functions as a measure of value and either in its own person or by a representative as the medium of circulation is money. Gold or silver is therefore money. It functions as money on the one hand when it has to be present in its own golden person. It is then the money commodity, neither merely ideal, as in its function of a measure of value, nor capable of being represented, as in its function of circulating medium. On the other hand, it also functions as money, when by virtue of its function, whether that function be performed in person or by a representative, it congeals into the sole form of value, the only adequate form of existence of exchange value, in opposition to use value, represented by all other commodities. Part A. Hoarding. The continual movement in circuits of the two antithetical metamorphoses of commodities, or the never-ceasing alteration of sale and purchase, is reflected in the restless currency of money, or in the function that money performs of a perpetuum mobile of circulation. But so soon as the series of metamorphoses is interrupted, so soon as sales are not supplemented by subsequent purchases, money ceases to be mobilized, it is transformed, as Boise Gilbert says, from moibel into immoibel, from movable into immovable, from coin into money. With the very earliest development of the circulation of commodities, there is also developed the necessity and the passionate desire to hold fast the product of the first metamorphosis. This product is the transformed shape of the commodity, or its gold chrysalis. Commodities are thus not sold for the purpose of buying others, but in order to replace their commodity form by their money form. From being the mere means of effecting the circulation of commodities, this change of form becomes the end and aim. The changed form of the commodity is thus prevented from functioning as its unconditionally alienable form, or as its merely transient money form. The money becomes petrified into a hoard, and the seller becomes a hoarder of money. Footnote. Monetary wealth is nothing but wealth in products transformed into money. Mercier de la Riviere, first C. Une valeur en production ne fait que changer de forme. A value in the form of products which has merely changed its form. First D, page 486. End note. In the early stages of the circulation of commodities, it is the surplus use value alone that are converted into money. Gold and silver thus become of themselves social expressions for superfluity or wealth. This naive form of hoarding becomes perpetual in those communities in which the traditional mode of production is carried on for the supply of a fixed and limited circle of home wants. It is thus with the people of Asia, and in particularly of the East Indies. Vanderlint, who fancies that the prices of commodities in a country are determined by the quantity of gold and silver to be found in it, asks himself why Indian commodities are so cheap. Answer, because the Hindus bury their money. From 1602 to 1734, he remarks, they buried 150 million pounds sterling of silver, which originally came from America to Europe. In the ten years from 1865 to 1866, England exported to India and China 120 million pounds in silver, which had been received in exchange for Australian gold. Most of the silver exported to China makes its way to India. Footnote. Tis by this practice they keep all their goods and manufactures at such low rates. Vanderlint, 1st C, page 95-96. End note. As the production of commodities further develops, every producer of commodities is compelled to make sure of the nexus rerum or the social pledge. His wants are constantly making themselves felt, and necessitate the continual purchase of other people's commodities, while the production and sale of his own goods require time, and depend upon circumstances. 
In order, then, to be able to buy without selling, he must have sold previously without buying. This operation, conducted on a general scale, appears to imply a contradiction. But the precious metals at the sources of their production are directly exchanged for other commodities. And here we have sales by the owners of commodities without purchases by the owners of gold or silver and subsequent sales by other producers, unfollowed by purchases, merely bring about the distribution of the newly produced precious metals among all the owners of commodities. In this way, all along the line of exchange, hoards of gold and silver of varied extent are accumulated. With the possibility of holding and storing up exchange value in the shape of a particular commodity arises also the greed for gold. Along with the extension of circulation increases the power of money, that absolutely social form of wealth ever ready for use. Gold is a wonderful thing. Whoever possesses it is lord of all he wants. By means of gold one can even get souls into paradise. Columbus in his letter from Jamaica, 1503. Since gold does not disclose what has been transformed into it, everything, commodity or not, is convertible into gold. Everything becomes saleable and buyable. Circulation becomes the great social retort into which everything is thrown, to come out again as gold crystal. Not even are the bones of saints, and still less are more delicate res sacrosancta, extra commercium hominum, able to withstand this alchemy. Just as every qualitative difference between commodities is extinguished in money, so money on its side, like the radical leveler that it is, does away with all distinctions. But money itself is a commodity, an external object, capable of becoming the private property of any individual. Thus social power becomes the private power of private persons. The ancients, therefore, denounced money as subversive of the economic and moral order of things. Modern society, which soon after its birth pulled Plutus by the hair of his head from the bowels of the earth, greets gold as its holy grail, as the glittering incarnation of the very principle of its own life. Footnote. Money is a pledge. John Bellers, Essays about the Poor, Manufactures, Trade, Plantations, and Immorality. London, 1699, page 13. End note. Footnote. A purchase, in the categorical sense, implies that gold and silver are already the converted form of commodities, or the product of a sale. End note. Footnote. Henry III, most Christian king of France, robbed cloisters of their relics and turned them into money. It is well known what part the despoiling of the Delphic temple by the Phocians played in the history of Greece. Temples with ancients served as the dwellings of the gods of commodities. They were sacred banks. With the Phoenicians, a trading people par excellence, money was the transmuted shape of everything. It was, therefore, quite in order that the virgins, who at the feast of the goddess of love, gave themselves up to strangers, should offer to the goddess the piece of money they received. End note. Footnote. Gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold. Thus much of this will make black white, foul, fair, wrong, right, base, noble, old, young, coward, valiant. What this, you gods, why this will lug your priests and servants from your sides, pluck stout men's pillows from below their heads? This yellow slave will knit and break religions, bless the accursed, make the whore leprosy adored, place thieves and give them title, knee and approbation, with senators on the bench. This is it, that makes the wappened widow wet again. Come, damned earth, though common whore of mankind. Shakespeare, Timon of Athens. End note. Note. Sophocles, Antigone. End note. Note. The desire of avarice to draw Pluto himself out of the bowels of the earth. The Dipnosophists. 6. 23. Athenius. End note. A commodity in its capacity of a use value satisfies a particular want, and is a particular element of material wealth. But the value of a commodity measures the degree of its attraction for all other elements of material wealth, and therefore measures the social wealth of its owner. To a barbarian owner of commodities, and even to a West European peasant, value is the same as value form, and therefore to him the increase in his hoard of gold and silver is an increase in value. It is true that the value of money varies, at one time, in consequence of a variation in its own value at another, in consequence of change in value of commodities. 
But this, on the one hand, does not prevent two hundred ounces of gold from still containing more value than one hundred ounces, nor, on the other hand, does it hinder the actual metallic form of this article from continuing to be the universal equivalent form of all other commodities, and the immediate social incarnation of all human labor. The desire after hoarding is in its very nature unsatiable. In its qualitative aspect, or formerly considered, money has no bounds to its efficacy, i.e., it is the universal representative of material wealth, because it is directly convertible into any other commodity. But at the same time, every actual sum of money is limited in amount, and therefore, as a means of purchasing, has only a limited efficacy. This antagonism between the quantitative limits of money and its qualitative boundlessness continually acts as a spur to the hoarder in his Sisyphus-like labor of accumulating. It is with him as it is with a conqueror who sees in every new country annexed only a new boundary. In order that gold may be held as money, and made to form a hoard, it must be prevented from circulating, or from transforming itself into a means of enjoyment. The hoarder, therefore, makes a sacrifice of the lusts of flesh to his golden fetish. He acts in earnest up to the gospel of abstention. On the other hand, he can withdraw from circulation no more than what he has thrown into it in the shape of commodities. The more he produces, the more he is able to sell. Hard work, saving, and avarice are, therefore, his three cardinal virtues, and to sell much and buy little the sum of his political economy. Footnote. These are the pivots around which all the measures of political economy turn, the maximum possible increase in the number of sellers of each commodity, and the maximum possible decrease in the number of buyers. Very, page 52, end note. By the side of the gross form of a hoard, we find also its aesthetic form in the possession of gold and silver articles. This grows with the wealth of civil society. Soyons riches ou parisons riches, Diderot. In this way there is created, on the one hand, a constantly extending market for gold and silver, unconnected with their functions as money, and on the other hand, a latent source of supply, to which recourse is had principally in times of crisis and social disturbance. Hoarding serves various purposes in the economy of metallic circulation. Its first function arises out of the conditions to which the currency of gold and silver coins is subject. We have seen how, along with the continual fluctuations in the extent and rapidity of the circulation of commodities, and in their prices, the quantity of money current unceasingly ebbs and flows. This mass must, therefore, be capable of expansion and contraction. At one time money must be attracted in order to act as circulating coin, at another circulating coin must be repelled in order to act again as more or less stagnant money. In order that the mass of money, actually current, may constantly saturate the absorbing power of the circulation, it is necessary that the quantity of gold and silver in a country be greater than the quantity required to function as coin. This condition is fulfilled by money taking the form of hoards. These reserves serve as conduits for the supply or withdrawal of money, to or from the circulation, which in this way never overflows its banks. Footnote. Quote, there is required for carrying on the trade of the nation a determinate sum of specific money which varies, and is sometimes more, sometimes less, as the circumstances we are in require. This ebbing and flowing of money supplies and accommodates itself without any aid of politicians. The buckets work alternately. When money is scarce, bullion is coined. When bullion is scarce, money is melted. End quote. Sir D. North first c postscript page three john stuart mill who for a long time was an official of the east india company confirms the fact that in india silver ornaments still continue to perform directly the functions of a hoard the silver ornaments are brought out and coined when there is a high rate of interest and go back again when the rate of interest falls mill's evidence on reports on bank acts eighteen fifty seven page two thousand and eighty four According to a parliamentary document of 1864 on the gold and silver import and export of India, the import of gold and silver in 1863 exceeded the export by 19,367,764 pounds sterling. During the eight years immediately preceding 1864, 
the excess of imports over exports of the precious metals amounted to one hundred and nine million six hundred fifty two thousand nine hundred seventeen pounds sterling during this century far more than two hundred million pounds has been coined in india End note. End of chapter three section three part a